sadly, we start another show with another fake Caitlin Clark Angel Reese controversy. We live in a sad, pathetic, putrid attention economy right now. And it is sad and pathetic. But I would like to argue that the problem isn't necessarily on the supply side, if we're going to use the economy analogy here. It's the demand. I'll explain. When it comes to the media, what gets views gets rewarded. Could the media unilaterally decide not to be terrible? They could, uh, to an extent, but also no, because it's too big. It's too varied. The media encompasses everything from the world's biggest news outlets to bloggers who have very little following, even within the niche they want to be in. Nevertheless, uh, on a grander scale. The media is enormous. And, by the way, fans also are not any kind of monolith. And so asking uh, fans of sports in general to stop rewarding the attention whores who know race baiting uh, will get them a bunch of clicks and a bunch of views and a bunch of attention, um, that's, that's actually not going to work either. But... Assuming that I'm speaking mostly to fans and not to media members right now, we'll have the internal meeting later. But assuming that I am speaking mostly to fans right now and not to media members, um, you can help. And so I'm begging you, please, for the love of our, our sports culture and really our larger culture, please help and stop engaging with the people who suck. Stop engaging with the bad actors. I know it's tempting. And the thing is, I'm not even talking about people like I'm actually specific, specifically talking about the people who are watching this Caitlin Clark Angel Reese saga. And if you missed it yesterday, God bless you. God bless you that you have missed the last 24 hours of nonsense. Perhaps you saw the game. Maybe you've seen whatever. Um, and, and, you know, if that's great and you missed the outrage, that's that's actually the best thing because then you got to enjoy the sports and not see the stupidity that followed. However, uh, if you have consumed any kind of sports media online or on television or anything over the last 24 hours, chances are you know that in the game between the Chicago Sky and the Indiana Fever yesterday, Angel Reese tried to block Caitlin Clark's shot, just regular old block on a regular old drive in the half court, and she missed the ball and hit Caitlin Clark in the head, and it was a basketball whoopsie, and they called a flagrant foul upon reviewing it, which is the correct call. It's contact above the head and neck. That is why the rule exists. It was a flagrant one, not a flagrant two. It wasn't excessive. It wasn't intentional. That's why the flagrant one exists. Hey, bravo, WNBA referees. You got one right. About damn time. But we'll take better late than never. Excellent job out of you. Predictably, afterwards, people were terrible. People could not control themselves. And if you're mad at the people who could not control themselves, I'm actually talking to you more than the people that could not control themselves. Because I know it's tempting to dunk on people on social media. And I know that it's it's also tempting to try to highbrow it and give some thoughtful and insightful takedown of a bad take. I've certainly done both of those things. But if you absolutely must, do it without engaging the post. Do not feed the algorithm. Uh... There's a saying in social media circles uh, that is, I think, very true, which is retweet your friends, screenshot your enemies. Retweet your friends, scre screenshot your enemies. Why? Because when Facebook, Twitter, etc. see you interact with something, which is not a screenshot, that's, that's you doing it outside of their algorithm. We're talking reply, we're talking quote tweet, we're talking comment, we're talking share. They feed you more of it. And that's how it works. And so it... it the rage tends to spiral. Not only do you get it, but the other people who are interested in the same thing that you're interested in, they get it. That's how Instagram specifically works. I can't tell you how often I like something on Instagram and then five seconds later, my wife's like, have you seen this? Or the opposite in reverse. Like that literally, it's like, oh, you like this? Your wife's also going to like this. Boop, next on her feed. And that happens on all the social media algorithms to varying extents. So you get more of that stuff. And then what happens is, especially on Twitter, it feels like suddenly everyone is saying the terrible thing because all it's doing is feeding you similar stuff. And then you're in the rabbit hole. 
the thing is, you're not actually in a rabbit hole. You're in an echo chamber. And all that you're hearing are the loudest voices that keep getting hand-delivered to you. So the mantra is, again, if you would like to help get us out of our hellhole scape of a uh, social media, especially driven media landscape, retweet your friends, screenshot your enemies. Make your enemies topics as well, not just people. Someone tries to start a culture war over a routine flagrant at one, screenshot it if you must reply. Or, better idea, crazy thought, just keep scrolling. Or stop scrolling. Just don't engage with it at all. Put your phone down. Go outside. Say hello to your kids. Mow the grass. Do something. Find something. Anything. But the thing is, it's not actually just social media, which if it was just like a purely online story, I wouldn't I wouldn't talk about this very much today. I certainly wouldn't want, want wouldn't go on another full diatribe about the state of modern society and media because I feel like I've done that four times in the last week and even though there's plenty to say on the topic I, I this is not why I do this. This this is not the job that I signed up for. But when CNN decides to cover a routine flagrant foul in a WNBA basketball game, a men's college basketball game, women's and NBA, anything. They are covering a routine flagrant foul in a basketball game. Oh my God, please change the channel. Kill their ratings. They get minute by minute reports of their ratings on cable television. Make sure they see their little chart, have a cliff of people going, nah, we didn't come here for this. We're not, we're not doing this. Like, there isn't enough important news for them to cover as an international news organization. And by the way, if they want to dip into sports, go cover Kylian Mbappe, the French superstar uh, you yesterday on the eve of French elections, uh, which are happening this week en France. Uh, he urged the French youth to not vote for far-right extremists who he says are trying to divide the country. That's up your alley, CNN. That's That's politics. That's news. That's international. You're a big, giant international organization. That's that's something I would love for you to cover. And even if you want to Americanize it, talk about what athletes that have and have not done similar types of things here. Don't cover a play that wouldn't require anything other than a, my bad, at the park. That's not what you do. Get out of here. So, so why, though? Why is this happening? That's that's the core question here. Like, not not who is doing this, because that devolves, and, like, whose fault is it? Because that devolves quickly into finger-pointing and nonsense. But why? Why are we like this? And what the hell can we do to stop it? Because, to turn it a, more serious for a second, more somber for a second, sports used to be something that we shared together. It's actually what kind of makes the whole thing go. On a, on a large scale level. It was a communal event. A communal experience that we all shared through relatively the same lens. And Jerry Brewer actually wrote a column last week in the Washington Post that uh, I thought put it very well. It said, We're more intentional than ever about sitting in different sections of the stadium, viewing the action from vastly different angles, and pressuring rabid followers to experience sports our way. Superimpose the issues causing national fissures and the conversations already hemorrhaging nuance turn hostile. And that's exactly what's happened. Is everyone is trying to put everything that happens in their own narrative through their own lens in their own bucket. It's an extension of something Trevor Noah said when I saw him a few weeks ago at Constitution Hall. It was part of the Off the Record Tour, uh, which was named because he wanted people to actually be present and he didn't want anything recorded. So Trevor, I'm so terribly sorry for taking something out of that room. Uh, and, and putting it on the radio, but it was incredibly profound. It stuck with me ever since, and it's too good not to share. But uh, Noah, of course, the comedian, used to host The Daily Show, uh, said, because we all live in our phones so much, and because of what we're doing in our phones, we're on social media, uh, and because that is so tailored to us, we're all living in our own worlds more than ever. We're fed an algorithm of what what the world is to us through our phones all the freaking time. And eventually that tailored world becomes our reality. Now back to me editorializing off of what Trevor said in his observation, 
Because the thing is, that's actually not reality. Reality is reality. So eventually, the real reality hits us in the face, and then we're not ready for it. And it's human nature when you're not ready for something to lash out and be defensive. And so the the solution to all of this is be ready for it. And that means a couple of different things. One, it means get off of your phone. All of us. I am I need to do this so badly. So this is this is us together. This is not me finger pointing. This is saying, come join me in a mission to get off my damn phone and live in reality. Listen to people, read a book, touch some grass, have human interaction, and realize that there's a lot of people starving for attention, and you actually don't have to give it to them. You can just ignore them, and we can all do it together in reality. Because nobody watching that game yesterday saw that foul by Angel Reese and thought it was anything other than a block attempt that missed. And sometimes when you go to block a shot and you miss, you hit the offensive player in the head. I, if you've played any extensive amount of basketball, you have both had that happen to you and done it to somebody. So just let it be that. And while a gigantic and predictable group of doofuses feigned outrage and made a routine basketball whoopsie into a race war and showed themselves to be thoroughly embarrassing in the process, we all knew it was coming. And yet, what did some people do? Engaged with them. But we're not going to do that anymore. That's the mission of this segment. We're not going to do it anymore. Just We're going to ignore them because they want attention. So don't give it to them. Don't reward the bad actors. When your dog takes a leak on the carpet, you don't give the dog a treat. So don't do that. But also, I would say this. Don't get preemptively mad either. Because the people watching the game yesterday in real time actually cared about the basketball. And I saw people reacting to the outrage before I actually saw the outrage. They just knew it was coming. And that's not to say that you're wrong. And because it was going to take... ESPN and Just Women's Sports and Bleacher Report and CNN, apparently, cutting that highlight and showing it to people for then the bad actors who weren't watching the game because they don't actually care in the first place, raising their pitchforks. But, like, you see it beforehand. The, the reaction to the outrage before there's anything to react to. And then the first person goes in, and then it's like, ah, everybody get them. And it's like, okay, well, that person came in for attention. All you did was just heap on so much attention. You gave the dog who peed on the carpet a treat. No. Bad human. <laughs> it's a lot harder to be disappointed in people if you expect them to be terrible. <laughs> and I know that's not satisfying, but you spend a lot less rage that way. And really, they're in it to make you mad. So don't give them that satisfaction. They're on a slow path to self-destruction. Just let them self-destruct. Let them keep flagging themselves until eventually there is, there is no flesh left. Let them scream at their, each other in their corner of the internet. The rest of us can be out here enjoying the game or not watching at all because no one says you have to watch. If you weren't watching yesterday, that's fine. It was Father's Day. Go be with your kids or go be with your, your dad or your husband or... If you got none of those things, go be with yourself doing whatever it is that you were doing. That's fine. You can just keep doing that. And if all of a sudden someone's screaming about a flagrant foul in a basketball game, that is no business screaming about a flagrant foul in a basketball game, especially one where there's absolutely nothing to scream about, uh, comes into your world, you just go like, hey, sorry, uh, the this is an attention horror-free zone. Uh, the, the screaming section's over there. That's the corner uh, of the internet where you do that. Please redirect yourself. You seem to be lost. And to model that behavior, I'm going to try and be the change that I want to see in the world. So coming up next, we're going we're gonna to really do this. Five takeaways about an actual basketball game that I and millions of other people watched that had nothing to do with a routine correctly called flagrant and foul, of which there's absolutely no controversy and thus absolutely nothing to talk about. That's next on The Hoffman Show. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.